So welcome everybody. This is In Their Moccasins and it's presented by Serena Johnson and Tanya Poba. Mm -hmm. Hi everyone, Ani Bojo, Ms. Gose Gichimoshwe Manadokwe Indigenakaz, Lene Lenape Nehia Caldwell First Nation, Ikwa Celtic, Nunjaba. So hi everyone, I'm Serena Johnson. I'm a Crane Clan member of Caldwell First Nation. I'm also Nehia Metis and Lene Lenape, and I work with Indigenous uh, Resurgence and Student Services at X University, and I'm also in a first year PhD at Boise at U of T. Um, so I'm speaking to you from Tiparanto, the traditional territory of the Three Fires Anishinaabe Confederacy, the Six Nations Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron Wendat. And Tanya? Hi, yeah, I'm supporting Serena in this project. I'm a board game designer, I, I fly drones, I make artificial intelligence chatbots, and I'm a virtual and augmented reality practitioner. And I'm currently a PhD student at the uh, X University and York University's uh, communication and culture program. And I have a background as a reporter. Okay, so welcome everyone. It is so good to be here with you today in virtual community. And we're super excited to share this project and get some of your feedback. Um, so part of my role in student affairs is creating Indigenous training exercises and resources for settler staff who want to be better able to support Indigenous students. And with COVID, all of that has been online. Um, so I've been doing some other work at the university with various working groups, including the Kairos Blanket Exercise, which is an in-person activity. And it aims to teach Indigenous history in a way that builds empathy because people can hear all the harsh facts about Indigenous people that you want, but facts are sterile and um, we need to humanize them. We need people to care so that they can be part of changing it. And I thought if we could make a game where they played as an Indigenous student going through their day, making decisions, um, you could see how the legacies of colonization are actually part of these small decisions in the days like here and now of our students. So the thing is, um, to do this as a game, like I'm, I'm not a gamer and I had no idea how to do it. So Tanya was the, she was like a saving grace. Um, she's a PhD student at X and she just so happens to be an expert on building games that develop empathy. So between Tanya's expertise and the creativity of the indigenous authors that we brought together, um, we're creating something that's innovative and hopefully will be helpful as well. Um, our group has no hierarchy. We wanted Indigenous students to be able to tell their own stories, so like nothing about us without us. Uh, and most of them are students, and a lot of them are students at X, but they're not all students. They're, some of them are at other schools, and we're treating them like authors. They're creators. Um, we're not going to pay them. We're not paying them minimum wage. We're valuing their stories, so we're paying closer to industry rates and style. Um, we, they're young adults, some are mature students, some are parents trying to make a better lives for themselves, their families and their communities. And they're struggling with a lot just to be here with us. And that's what the whole thing is about. So indigenous people, um, we say we've been researched to death and we're super sick of telling our traumatic personal stories over and over and over for audience consumption. Uh, and we thought this could be more fun if we did it in a fictional, fictionalized style. So then there is the freedom to add elements of your, of your own story if you want, um, but it's also protected. There's anonymity and there's freedom to involve things like portals to other dimensions, which we have done. Um, last summer, I got to see Beth LaPonce at an international conference on games and narrative. And she said, don't be in God mode, prescribing how the players should interact in the game. Uh, the players have sovereignty. So my approach to this project was to not be in God mode about the project. Um, every participant has sovereignty and even the project itself, because in Anishinaabe language, the genders are not male and female, but animate and inanimate. So we consider this project to be alive and Tanya and I and the rest of the team are just stewards of it. So now I will pass it to Tanya to introduce us to one of our characters. Okay, thank you so much, Serena. So this is one of the characters that uh, we built uh, collectively, and this is Eugene. So now I'm going to actually take you through 
of the demo of Eugene. And this is a, a, a day and a bit in the life of Eugene um, as, as created by our, our authors, okay? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna actually take you to um, the beginning of this game. Oops, sorry, go back. So this is the start of Eugene's day. And we're basically using H5P and press books and one of the terrific things that Serena has done is really created a brand new methodology for game creation with this project. So what we've done, and we've, we've included uh, some content warnings in this um, because it is an amalgamation of everyone's inputs into Eugene. There are many characters in these modules. And as uh, Serena uh, identified, there's also a culminating module that talks about indigenous futurisms for education, for society, and it's one of the most exciting things and, and we will be demoing that at a later point, but it's a very, very ex exciting narrative. So as you go through the module, you can see that um, it's about Eugene and what the students and, and authors and creators have done is make this a multimedia experience. So we've selected sound effects. I'm just going to play a really quick sound effect here to kind of make it an immersive experience in H5P using the branching scenario. So you've got a little bit of sound. This is a Creative Commons sound of a lacrosse field. And we talk about Eugene's experience playing lacrosse because in this particular instantiation, this character is a student athlete and he's playing on a university league. And we talk about the pressures of being a student athlete in this module, um, but talking about also the disrespect that this, this character might experience in um, sport contexts. And so one of the things that was really important to the authors was educating as we go. So Eugene's narrative, and this is just one sample narrative, there are others, has a lot of, of sort of question and answer um, components. And this was a really good idea on the part of our creators to educate as we go, as you're going through story. And so actually I'm gonna, um, at this point, ask everyone you know, um, about this particular question. This was a very important question for the, the authors to include. And I'm just gonna ask the audience, you know, uh, what do you think the answer to this question is? This is a little opportunity for some audience participation. What do we think the answer is here? And this is again, an opportunity for student support staff and instructors to educate themselves about in the indigenous experience. Does anyone have any thoughts? Okay, great. Yep, absolutely. So Michelle, you've said um, false and false, and you are correct. So indigenous people overwhelmingly pay taxes often at a higher rate than other identities unless they work on a reserve. So um, absolutely right, uh, Irene as well, and uh, Luftaya as well. Thank you so much. Okay, we're gonna proceed through the module. Now there, here's another opportunity um, to talk a little bit about you know, some of the experiences, particularly in sport, where there are often frequent injuries, um, head injuries, and here's, here's a, a discussion about Eugene struggling with um, prescription pills being prescribed by his physician. And despite the fact that he's hurting, he's afraid to take the pain pills his doctor has prescribed to him. And we've got some sound effects here. And, you know, um, we talk a little bit about uh, prescription opioids and uh, the, the impacts of overdose uh, in this narrative. And we talk about grief, which is something that a lot of students in post-secondary are dealing with right now, given that we are going through um, the pandemic. Especially in Indigenous communities, you get a lot more grief than, than other students. Um, you'll get students that have to leave for funerals, like quite often and it could be during exams or when assignments are due. And so there needs to be a lot more flexibility to understand that when you have communities in crisis, you're going to have things like that come up. We, I mean, we're even in grief right now. We, a, a student um, just passed away last week and, and Tanya and I are both personally affected by that right now. So it's like, this is a part of our reality in indigenous communities. That's absolutely right. 
And this is this the entire idea, Serena's idea for this project is helping instructors, there, there are probably instructors on the line right now, people who are student support staff in understanding the heavy burden of grief, of loss, of, of the challenges with um, struggling with, with, with the economic factors as students. And that is an incredibly important cognitive empathy that is required among student support staff and instructors. And this has been something of uh, like a passion project for all of us. I'm a student as well, to really help um, the institutions understand the heavy burden of grief, of, of loss, and, and give um, students, Indigenous students particularly, some grace during these times. So we talk about academic probation, we talk about you know, the pressures that student athletes go through, we talk about real experiences with that overwhelming pressure we all have to succeed and, and anxiety and depression. And we have you know, sound effects again, making that a rich and immersive experience. Okay. And one of the things about um, the mental health piece that, you know, we highlight the mental health piece in our various characters, but we also are trying to illustrate that it's not just them being pathologized, that it's not just Indigenous people have more mental health or whatever, that it's the context, it's situational, it's because of all of these policies and history of colonization in Canada, what is now called Canada. That's absolutely right. And the systemic barriers to um, students who are black indigenous or persons of color in the academy. Um, and this is actually, again, you know, a lot of these are rooted in based in everyone's experience in post secondary. So this this notion that you, know, you, you feel like a, a number, a faceless number um, in an institution. Um, some instructors you know, tell students not to contact them ever. Right. And um, and sometimes students are reaching out for help and don't get uh, that help or support. OK, so this can help um, staff and faculty to be able to better help Indigenous students, but it's also going to inform their praxis to help all students. Exactly right. And this is this is meant to be a resource for everyone. Um, in every context. It's about building cognitive empathy, where you understand better and you can put yourself in the position of a student um, and understand the, the economic um, and cultural context from which they are coming uh, from. So, you know, here's, and this is based on true stories. Uh, you know, Eugene is meeting with a student support worker and the worker said that Eugene shouldn't worry about failing classes because Indigenous students get their university for free. Is what the worker saying true or false of Indigenous students? And this is where that audience participation could come in again. What do we think? What do we think? Is that true or false? Do, do Indigenous students get their university for free? Okay, I got it uh, from uh, Tanya or Tanya, like me. Um, false, good. Some do. Okay, good. From, from Michelle, let's try false. Okay, so we're going to check that. And, and actually, Julie uh, and Michelle, you're both right in that um, you were right. Uh, well, federal government provides some funding for Inuit and First Nations for tuition, living expenses, and travel costs. There's often not enough funding to meet demand. Many eligible students don't get any funding at all. Non-status and uh, Métis students don't qualify for any uh, funding. Okay, so moving on. And again, um, a lot of these are based on real, real, real happenings, real situations that um, that are occurring. Um, Eugene is frequently called upon to do unpaid work as an Indigenous student athlete to represent his school. He has to attend meetings with donors and meetings about improving services for Indigenous students, and he has to pretend that everything's okay in front of school leaders and high profile donors. You know, and this is uh, sitting in, in meetings with and hopefully you can see that um, multimillionaires will struggling to pay rent. Um, he feels used as a student to act as a representative for school with unpaid labor. Um, you know, and some of the meetings he attends feel violent and oppressive um, things said in those meetings, but he has to smile for the cameras and pretend everything is fine. And so here's another opportunity to answer a quiz question based on this prototype. Um, you know, what should Eugene do about all of these unpaid uh, requests. And here's another opportunity for audience participation. What do we think? Should he speak his mind to organizers and let him know their cons his concerns? 
Should he seek counsel from the Indigenous community members and collect wisdom, wisdom about how to navigate these requests? Or should he stop doing all of these activities, even if it, he fears he might endanger his relationship with the school? So what do we think? Any thoughts? Okay, good, uh, good response. One and two, mostly, yep, seek counsel. Seek counsel. Good, good instincts. Okay, so let's try that. And what we've done here is we've actually shared experiences and there's some advice um, embedded in each of these responses. So there's no perfect answer here, but seeking wisdom and strength in community is always a wise practice. Okay, and we actually have little information boxes where we share additional um, good and wise practices to get through these types of issues. So there's some embedded advice from real experiences in these in these modules. And this is again based on a, a, a set of true stories. Um, just, you know, Eugene just attended an important university meeting in the evening and realized he had to get groceries. He was followed through the supermarket by a security guard. He's tired of being treated like a criminal on his own lands. So Eugene is tired of being treated like a crim criminal. It happens all the time. How should he handle this? Should he confront the manager of the store or should he pay for his groceries and go home? What do we think? This is your opportunity to kind of put yourself in Eugene's shoes. What do we think? It's a hard one. No, absolutely right. It is. It's really hard. There is no right. Laura, you're absolutely correct. There's no right answer. Let's try um, confronting. Let's see what happens. Okay. So Eugene has finally had enough. He speaks to the grocery store manager. Eugene calmly explains his issue with being followed by store security. The manager is defensive, rude, and starts accusing Eugene of making trouble. The manager threatens to call the police, and Eugene shakes his head and pays and leaves. Okay, so you can see that that's not, that's, there's no good answer, right? And now he's rattled by his encounter with the grocery store manager, and he feels cold and alone. This city, this lifestyle feels like it's killing him. He wishes he had someone to talk to to understand what he was going through. Okay. And then he's up at the crack of dawn for lacrosse practice after everything he's just gone through. And this is the only place where he can feel free. He feels in control. He feels the wind on his face and knows he loves this game. And this is where then all of the characters, they all converge. They all meet each other. Okay, so we only have time to demo one, but this is an opportunity for they all meet up in various ways throughout the story. And he's going to meet a very important character, um, Marla, who is the first character that Serena created for these games. And she is actually the, the key to all of this. And she will take them into another place where you can see a better world, a world free of colonialism, a, a world free of discrimination and abuse. And she wants him to come with her to meet some people. Okay, and you proceed again. And so this is, and then it, it links to the other modules. So you get a full and immersive experience and get to know all of these various characters with, um, with these various challenges. And, and Laura, you're absolutely right in the chat. Debriefing is really challenging, but that's the key. That's the key to serious games, um, compelling nature is the debrief. The debrief is almost the most important part where you then have an opportunity to talk as a group virtually um, and say, how do we feel about what just happened? And it, exactly, debriefing is critical. And that's a big key part to Serena's methodology. So with that, I'm going to actually hand things back to Serena, just to, to sum up. And I'll go back to the presentation. Sure. So um, at the end, when Eugene met Marla, that was another character. And we have the characters meet and go through a transformative experience. And this was a really like rewarding part of our author content jams. So we had circles where we got together to write, um, to write story and to think about, to think about it all, the whole project. And we asked students, you know, what would a decolonial post-secondary education institute look like? And the fact that we were able to use creativity, um, you know, we, we imagined things in other dimensions or we imagined things as if colonizers had never arrived. Uh, we thought about the War of 1812 and how Tecumseh had been trying to organize an Indigenous state in on Turtle Island. Um, so we thought about, you know, we got to think about 
um, these radical concepts and and really dig into the futurism piece and following from Afrofuturism um, and a little bit um, linking to the work of Dr. Karen Recolet at U of T, who talks about um, kin and you know star teachings and kin installations and um, the choreography of the fall. Uh, we got to talk about yeah, we just got to really dig into futurisms because you know futurisms is a radical act in itself of indigenous people imagining ourselves in the future because everything about colonization was designed to you know to eradicate us and we weren't even supposed to be here now still learning our languages and practicing our cultures let alone be in the future so i think we could probably open it up to questions we have about 10 minutes um or just feedback like what do folks think um are there any suggestions any curiosities yeah, I'll just keep it open. Yeah, uh, Stevie has a great question in the chat about additional resources. So that is a really good question. And one of the, the ways in which Serena has organized this project and the methodology behind this project is actually a very, very important deliverable we're including in the press books. Serena used a lot of different techniques like improv. And Serena, I don't know if you want to speak to that, but it was such a fruitful um interactive jam session that you did with students with with authors with content creators with illustrators to get to this place and i don't know if you want to talk about that sure um just briefly uh i wanted to use the the practice from improv where there's no wrong answer so it's always yes and um and so we used that and then we also brought in the seven grandparent teachings as a ways that um, like our, our code of conduct so that we could create a good, you know, do do this project in a good way. And we had initially thought we would create the separate characters and we would send little teams of people into different breakout rooms to work on their characters. Um, but we followed from the lead of the authors and they wanted to stay in circle. So we stayed in circle and we did everything collaboratively. And so we maybe spent a little bit more time um on on this than we could have but what we've done is built a little community and we now have every friday afternoon we have open author content sessions where people can just drop in and and check in on each other if they want to um but we've yeah we formed a little collective of creators indigenous young people who are creators um who want to continue doing this kind of work in the future on other projects We have a really good question, uh, comment and question from Laura in the chat about the wrong facilitators uh, could be very thought provoking. Uh, so the, the wrong kind of facilitation could really, really be traumatizing for students. And I think that's a really good point. Yes, and this is not, um, um, this is meant for faculty and staff. So we did want it to be a little bit triggering because we wanted to get that affect. Um, but for student participants, yes, it absolutely could have been um, could have been rough. And that's why we had to, that's why we opted to keep it creative um, and to give people the, you know, to take people's lead on how much and how they wanted to participate. And a really, really important question from Stevie in, in the chat about, you know, who did we connect with um, in terms of uh, Indigenous communities and knowledge holders? And how did this, how did this, uh, this content come together? Mm hmm yes um i consulted with one elder at another institution and then primarily with um elder joanne delaire at x university um and then there was another knowledge keeper at u of t who um, who's part of our advising board so between them and then a lot of our um, participants are actually you know many knowledge keepers themselves so we kind of all have that that um, perspective. And I'm just seeing a question from Andrea about sharing it with colleagues, and it will be available on the eCampus website um, as of, I believe, March. So this is our first actual play testing. Um, this is the first iteration, and we're just completing the module now. And yes, it will be also it will be remixable, so you could edit it to your own context. 
That's exactly right. And and um, we've made it obviously with a H5P and a Pressbooks um, platform, it's all modular as well. So you can pick up different parts of the modules, um, embed them in your own content. But I think the, the, the total context is really, really important. The understanding that this was created by Indigenous creators for um, for settler student support staff and and instructors to understand and have that context. Um, and so there's modularity in, in the, the content, but there's also a roadmap that Serena has created that is going to be in the press book. So you can see how this was done, the methodology she used to create this content, and then it's remixable exactly as Serena says, so you can add and augment and extend and change. And I see um, Stevie's comment also mentions that the performance of indigeneity, and I'm not sure if I'm interpreting this right, but um, I also have, um, I find it very problematic that we are repeatedly asked to perform our identities in very tokenizing efforts at institutions like in higher education, for example. And that's something that I have struggled with. And so we try to address that um, in a few different character narratives in the stories as well. So thank you for that. Okay, and we only have a couple more minutes. So welcome to anyone else. And I think we've got some contact information right here at the end. If, uh, if you wanted to contact Serena, um, here's her contact information. And this is the press books. It, we've made it uh, public just for the time, the time being, um, just for the purposes of this of this demo. Um, and we're basically just in the process of getting um, playtesting information, uh, troubleshooting. Um, so we really welcome feedback, and it will be in a press book format in the Open Library at eCampus Ontario upon delivery in March. Great. 